All right, well, we already prayed for our service, so let's turn to Acts chapter 3, and we're just going to cover two verses tonight, verse 7 and verse 8. It's all about praise, okay? Acts chapter 3, verse 7 says, and he took him by the right hand, and, and that was another reason for the right hand, because Jesus lifts us up with the right hand of his righteousness. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately... His feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaped up and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. So this man from his mother's womb had laid at the gate beautiful in the temple. He was paralyzed until the day Peter and John approached him. Jesus passed this man when he went into the temple. But there's a perfect timing with God. And I've found this, that God always moves pretty much at the midnight hour. Because that gives him the glory and the praise. And the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Amen? So seizing him by the right hand, immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. So let's talk about the right hand just for a minute. It is clear from several biblical verses that the right hand is a symbol in the Bible for strength. It's a symbol for strength. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Exodus chapter 15. So Gen Genesis and then Exodus, the second book in your Old Testament. Exodus 15 and verse 6. The scripture says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power, Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces the enemy. So God uses his right hand, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, to dash the enemy into pieces. And we have to believe God for the victory. Uh, it is amazing just all the things that have happened just in this church body by prayer. You know, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. But in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with praise and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So there are some of you here that haven't heard this story, and I just want to share it briefly. Uh, I came to this church a little over, uh, well, in November, it'll be eight years ago. Came here... Uh, just to join in the Monday night prayer. I, I was assistant pastor or associate pastor at another church in Orchid, but God sent me here to, to the Monday night prayer. And I so fell in love with the pastor of this church, Pastor Dave Meshagan, that I, I just really felt like the Lord was drawing me here. And then all of a sudden, our pastor out at that church uh, decided to take another church in Grover Beach. And then uh, or in a Royal Grandy, and then the other pastor found a wife online and moved. So <laughs> it's like, well, all the pastors left. I might as well leave too, <laughs> because they sent in a new uh, new pastor. And typically, when that happens, they pick a whole new team. So I felt released to come here. So after several years, uh, the pastor of this church passed away with cancer, and they brought in a new pastor. And during that time, uh, I became one of the elders in the church. And then when he left, they didn't have a pastor. And the bishop of this denomination asked me, uh, he knew that I had pastored a church before in Avila Beach, and he asked me, can you handle this group until we can find a pastor? So they found three different pastors. They brought them here, and they, uh, they uh, came and spoke. But the people voted. And so finally the people began to call our bishop up north and say, we don't want a pastor. Just leave it the way it is. If it's not broke, don't fix it. So he came down and met with me, and we talked, and he said, well, I can't. I can't put you in as pastor. You're not even ordained in this denomination. And I listened to him for a little bit, and he said, we, we can't put a pastor in a church of God without them being ordained in this denomination. So you know what I did? I submitted. I gave it to God. I said, okay, if that's your decision, I'll stay here and continue to preach and teach until you find a suitable pastor for this congregation. 
So we just submitted to it. And Marsha, I think you were in on that, on that phone call. She's our secretary. So yeah, she was in on the phone call. We just submitted and said, okay. Two weeks later, that same bishop called me and said, um, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be down in two weeks to install you as the permanent full-time pastor of Christian Family Church. And I said, is this Bishop Fisher? I thought it was maybe somebody from the church pulling my leg. He said, oh no, this is Bishop Fisher. And I said, well, two weeks ago you said that was impossible. And he said, yeah, well, I, I went and spoke with my supervisor. My, the, he's the head of all the churches of God in Northern America. And I told him the story, what was going on in Santa Maria. And he said, you get back there and put that guy in. So God can do the impossible. Amen? And it was impossible. In fact, uh, the, the lady who, who uh, is on our piano, Sandra Meshagan, she's just returned back from Arizona she told me in 55 years of serving God in the church of God, she had never one time seen anybody placed in the position of a pastor that wasn't ordained in the church of God. So God is able and God is willing if we will just believe. Now here's a man who was paralyzed from his birth. And he's laying at the gate beautiful in the temple as people were going in. And he was asking alms, asking money, asking for help from anybody. And I know Jesus passed by him and others passed by him. And I don't know what kind of help he got. But when Peter and John showed up, he asked alms from them. And Peter said to him, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then he reached out his right hand and we read those scriptures. And this man stood up and walked. You say, wow, those are cool stories from the Bible. We have a guy who comes here on Sunday night, David Strait. And David uh, had brain tumors and was in a wheelchair for a long time. And then God began to heal him. And then he was with a walker. And then he was with a cane. And one night he was at a restaurant here in, in Santa Maria. And he was visiting uh, with his parents having dinner. And apparently someone was over, overhearing their conversation. And he said, all of a sudden, this guy got up and came over to their table and said, do you want to be healed? And David, David just looked at him and said, well, what do you mean? And he said... Do you want to be healed? Do you want to walk with that cane or do you want to be healed? And he said, well, I want to be healed. And the man said, can I pray for you? And David was wondering, are you saved? You know, is this going to be a scriptural prayer? Or is this going to be some off the wall thing? But David said in his heart, he felt like, let this man pray for you. So the man prayed for him. And then he said, David, get up and walk. And David went to reach for his cane and he said, no, get up and walk. He reached out his hand, David took him by the hand, and I have his cane in my garage on my Thursday night Bible studies as proof that God still does these things today. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, 6 says, I am the God of Jacob, I change not. God never changes from Old Testament to New Testament. Same God, same miracles. He's just looking for people who believe. Amen? Amen? If you can believe, Mark 9, 23, all things are possible to him who believes. And this man believed. So the right hand, it's clear that it's a, it's a biblical symbol for strength. Let's take a look at Psalm 16. So Psalm's in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 16 and verse 8. The scripture says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I will not be moved. And then look at verse 11. The Bible says God will show us the pathway to life. In his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I think sometimes the Lord allows these trials into our life so that we can draw closer to Him. It seems like when everything goes well and everything's just running smoothly, yeah, we believe in God, but we don't thirst after Him and run after Him. 
But it seems like when troubles come, that's when we thirst after the Lord. We, we go after Him. And so you can imagine this man laying at the temple, the gate beautiful, for all these years paralyzed, was thirsting for someone to help him. And Peter and John said, I don't have gold and I don't have silver, but what I have, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, says, take up your bed and walk. And the Bible says he went leaping and walking and praising God. <laughs> leaping. You can imagine what the people thought in the temple. Is, is that that guy that was lame from his mother's womb? What's he doing running around the temple for? And you know, I'm sure the Pharisees were like, you can't run in the temple. It's not religious. You know, <laughs> and all that other craziness that happens in religious circles. Yet, here he was. So, it's a clear sign of strength. Let's take a look at Psalm 17 and verse 7. Just to show you how many times in the Bible God talks about the right hand. And, and you know, my dad was left-handed. And he was a strong man. His left hand was a lot stronger than his right hand. But typically, most people are right-handed. So God uses the fact that Christ sits at his right hand, and that right hand is a symbol of strength. Psalm 17, verse 7, Show us your marvelous loving kindness, O you who saves by your right hand those who put their trust in you from those who rise up against them. And this is exactly what's happened in our country for the last 20 or so months, is people have risen up against righteousness and morality and against goodness and against equity and against justice and against freedom. They've risen up. And God says, if you'll trust me, if you'll trust in the strength of my right hand, I will deliver you from those who have risen up against you. And yes, he will. Yes, he will. Psalm 1835. So we're just going to, we're in Psalms. We're just going to keep turning to the right, okay? Psalm 18 and verse 25 says... With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With an upright man, you will show yourself upright. So God wants us to walk uprightly. And then look at verse 35. You have also given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. You know, at the time when we're the weakest, God is the strongest. He says, in your weakness, my strength will be made perfect. And so at times, yeah, we're weak. We're all the same. We're all, we all struggle with all this that's been going on. But God is our strength. And then if you look at Psalm 20 and verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. Do you know that, church? Do you know that God saves his anointed? I cannot tell you how many times in my own personal life that the enemy has tried to take me down and God saves his anointed. God saves us. Even through some of our bad decisions or even sometimes our stupidity, God saves us because we're his children, we're his anointed. You know when your children mess up and they do something that's crazy... You don't throw them out in the garage and tell them, fend for yourself for a couple weeks till you get right. You try to instruct them and help them in the way to, to go. Amen? Don't you think a perfect God would do that for his children? When we're imperfect humans and we do that for our children? Amen? Amen. So take a look at Psalm 48 and verse 10. Psalm 48 and verse 10. It says, According to your name, O God... So is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. And then look at Psalm 60 and verse 5. I like the book of Psalms. It's the longest book in the Bible, 150 chapters. God allowed King David to write the longest book in the Bible. And it's truly all about prayers and praise. So when I need to, to know or learn how to pray for my enemies or to praise God, I go to the book of Psalms. And some people are shocked with some of the prayers in the book of Psalms. But I'm telling you, David was a man after God's own heart. He knew how to pray and he knew how to praise. 
So let's take a look again at Psalm 60 and verse 5. That thy beloved may be delivered, save with your right hand, God, and hear me. So the Lord is literally telling us, call upon Jesus. Call upon God's right hand, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'll save you. Psalm 73, verse 23, says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have holded me up by my, I, I have, thou hast holden me by my right hand. David is saying, Lord, I'm continually with you and you have held me up by your right hand. You know, God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. There was a time, uh, and I, I do travel a lot alone, and I was invited to speak at a church in San Ynez. And I remember one morning I was just having a pity party. You know, I was just driving to the church, and I just said, Lord, how come I always have to drive alone? I mean, it, it would be nice to have somebody go with me where I preach and, and I'm invited to speak. And you know what the Lord said to me? I looked over, and I could have swore he was sitting in the passenger seat. And all I heard the Lord say was, what about me? And I thought, duh, you know, I will never leave you or forsake you so that you may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. He said, I'll, I'll be with you even to the end of the world. We were never alone. God never leaves us. We always have his right hand right next to us. Psalm 98, and verse 1. Psalm 98, 1 says, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm has gotten him the victory. And that's what we're going to walk in. Yeah, I know the world is negative. Trust me, I, I quit listening to the news a long time ago. It's all negative and lies. I just will not listen to it anymore. But I, I want to listen to the good news. I want to hear what the good news is. I don't want to ever have to stand before God and have him say, Wow, you memorized all the people in the NFL, but you didn't know how to find the book of Job? You didn't, you didn't know any scriptures to help you along with this? And you could name all the players on the soccer team, really? You know, I don't want to be guilty of that. I want to know who my Father is. I want to know who my Savior is. I want to know that He promises me. And you know what? Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that He should lie. Neither the Son of Man that He should repent or that He should turn around from what He said. And then that scripture goes on to say in Numbers 23, 19, Has He spoken and shall He not do it? Has he said, and shall it not come to pass? Amen? Well, Hebrews 6.18 tells us it's impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised us before the world began. If God said it, he's going to do it. It's going to do it in his time. It's going to do it in his way. He's going to get all the glory. Amen. Psalm 110 and verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies thy footstool. God the Father told Jesus, Go ahead and sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. How's he going to do that? Well, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, starting with verse 11, the Apostle John was in heaven. And the Bible says the whole time he was up there, God was showing him everything that was going to happen in the future. And then all of a sudden, John says this in verse 11. In verse 11 I saw heaven opened, and behold, there was a white horse. And he who sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And he comes in righteousness to judge and make war. So at, in God's time, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, God opens up heaven and says, now's the time your enemies are going to become your footstool. Now's the time. So in, in his time, 
Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God will make all things beautiful in his time. But he has set the world in our hearts, the hearts of the sons of men, not to know the work that God is doing from the beginning to the end. So going back to my story, man, for those two weeks I was wondering, well, what's God going to do? I mean, I know God's going to do something, but what's it? Man, I didn't dream that I'd get that call and he would say, I'll be down in two weeks. I, it, it was furthest from my mind. I thought, well, maybe, you know, I'll last another three or four months until they find somebody in their denomination to take this church and then God will move me on somewhere else. But God did exceeding abundantly above everything that we asked or even hoped for. And don't you know that God is not a respecter of persons? If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. You just have to believe. So in Psalm 118 and verse 15, Psalm 118 and verse 15, it says, The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. My question is, is it? Are, are we rejoicing in, the ta- in, our, in our dwelling places? Are we thanking the Lord for what He's going to be doing? Because the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. God's right hand moves in such a way that it is amazing. It's amazing what God can do. Psalm 121, verse 5. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. The Lord will preserve your soul. The Lord will preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Do you believe it? Praise God. The Lord is our keeper. He's the one who keeps us. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5 says that. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed. So God is the one who's keeping us. He's the one who's holding us. He's the one who's in control. And I realize the big ugly face of the enemy has just popped up all over the world. That doesn't change who God is. Hey, on a cloudy day, the sun's still out. The clouds are just stopping the sun from shining through, but the sun's still out. And the moon comes up the same place every night it comes up. God is a faithful God. So Psalm, or excuse me, Isaiah chapter 41. So if you turn to your right, you get to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. This is your favorite verse, Nancy. Do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will hold you up with the right hand of my righteousness. I want to read that again. Take that personally. Take it as though Jesus himself were speaking that to you right now. Do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up with the right hand of my righteousness. And then Isaiah 41 and verse 13. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying unto you, Fear not, I will help you. So I want to tell you a story. So back in, I think it was 1987, uh, my mom passed away in 1979. I was 27. In 1987, my dad got cancer and was close to death. So I got a call from my stepmom, and she said, your dad's really bad. He's in the hospital in Phoenix. Uh, I think you should come and see him. So I prayed, and... And, and the Lord, I said, Lord, the whole time I've been a Christian, my dad has just doesn't want to talk about it. 
Uh, he got mad one time and came to visit me from Arizona and left the house, slammed the door, and I hadn't seen him since, although I had talked to him a few times on the phone. So he was against Christianity as we know it. Now, I know my dad went to the Greek Orthodox Church, and I know he knew about Jesus on the cross, but for some reason, man, when you mention Jesus and being saved, it just boiled his blood. So I got to Phoenix, and my whole family was there, my three brothers and my sister, and they were all standing in front of the uh, hospital room, and they said, okay, so we made a deal. We're not going to talk religion to Dad, period. Well, heck, I'm not religious anyway. I have a relationship with Jesus. I think religion sends people the other way. So I just said, you know, that's great that you guys made that decision. That's awesome. Wonderful. And they said, okay, then you can go in. So I went in, shut the door, and locked it. And then went over to where my dad's bed was and pulled that curtain all the way around him so they couldn't see what I was doing. And I sat down on the bed and I said, Dad, I'm not afraid of you anymore. I'm, what I am afraid of is that I'll never see you again if you don't get saved and accept Jesus as your Savior. And I said, I am gonna, I'm going to tell you what God told me to tell you while I'm here. You can get as mad as you want to get, but I'm not going to stop. And my dad was laying in the bed all crumpled up with cancer uh, at his weakest point I've ever seen him. And he said, okay, son, tell me. And I share very briefly how I accepted Christ as my Savior, how God drew me. And then I shared with him the scriptures, how that there's nobody righteous, not even one. How that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How that God said there's a payment for sin and the wages of sin is death. But dad, there's a gift and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he said, well, how would I get the gift? And I said, I'm so glad you asked because Romans chapter 10 verse 8 says, so what are we saying? We're talking, what are we preaching? We're preaching about the faith that if you believe that Jesus is Lord and you believe that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved because it's with your heart that you believe into righteousness and with your mouth you confess unto salvation. I said, Dad, the Bible says whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. The same Lord is rich upon all who call upon him, both the Jew and the Greek. And of course, my family's Greek. So my dad's ears perked up and I said, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I said, dad, do you want to be saved? And tears were running down his eyes because the word of God is alive. It's full of power. It's not my words, it's God's words, and they're powerful. The Bible says they're sharper than any two-edged sword. They pierce even to the division of our soul and our spirit. And God's word cut him. And, and, he, and I said, Dad, would you like to pray and receive Jesus? And he said, I would. And I said, i got to warn you. If you just say the words to shut me up, nothing's going to happen. But if you believe in your heart what you're praying... God will save you. And man, we prayed together and it was glorious. I felt the Holy Spirit in the room and he accepted Jesus as his Savior. And it was awesome. And then afterwards, he, he looked at me with this blank look on his face and he said, well, what do I do? And I said, what do you mean, what do you do? And he said, what do I do when I die? What do I do? And the only thing that came to me was that verse, Nancy, Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, be not dismayed, for I am with you. I am your God. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. So I said, Dad, here's what you do. When you begin to go, either Christ or an angel will come to get you. And all you need to do is hold out your hand, hold out your right hand. And he said, because my dad was left-handed, remember? And he said, why my right hand? And I said, because the Bible says he'll uphold you with the right hand of his righteousness. And the only way, if he comes to you, the only way is for you to grab him by the right hand. This is weird to try to go like this. Grab him by the right hand. So about a week and a half later, my dad was uh, at his home in Flagstaff, Arizona. They transferred him back home, had him on hospice. And my brother-in-law called me and said, we're with dad and we think he's really, really close to going. And I said, okay, put the phone on speaker and let me just be there with you guys. I can't be there, but let me be there with you, at least over the phone. So pretty soon I could hear them crying. I could hear my sister cry and then my brother cry. And 
uh, I could hear them, so I, I, I waited until they kind of stopped, and then Bill got back on the phone, and he said, your dad just went. And I said, wow. I said, praise God, Bill. You know, I, I really believe my dad put his faith in the Lord. And he said, yeah, something really weird happened just before he, he went limp. And I said, what's that? And he said, he got this look in his eyes, and then he went like this. And then his hand just dropped. And I thought, praise God. Praise God. He really, really got saved. You know, I, I wanted to encourage you with that because, again, we're talking about the right hand. Amen? And we really have to believe. My dad believed. He believed that when the angel or wh whoever it was, the Lord came, the right hand, because he is our strength. So... Isaiah 62 and verse 8. And I'm getting to it. That's why we need to praise Him. Because He is mighty to save. Isaiah 62 and verse 8 says, The Lord has sworn by His right hand. <laughs> so that tells me that God the Father swore by Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And by the arm of His strength, Surely, I will no more give your corn to be meat for your enemies, and the sons of the strangers will not drink your wine for the which you have labored. God is saying, in this past, people have been ripping your food off. They've been drinking your drink. But by, I swear by my right hand, it's not going to happen anymore. And you know, we just studied that last Sunday. We studied the story of Gideon, how the Amalekites and how the Midianites had come and destroyed all their crops, took all their food away. God says it's not going to happen again. It's not going to happen again. Let's take a look at Matthew 26 and verse 64. Is this coming through okay? Amen. Amen. Matthew 26 and verse 64. Okay, so this is when uh, Jesus is talking to the high priest. This is the night they illegally arrested him and had a trial for him at night. You know, it's illegal to have a trial at night. And so... Uh, in verse 63, Jesus held his priest, and the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure you, or I command you, by the living God, that you tell us whether or not you're the Christ, the Son of God. He said, I command you to do that. Jesus said to him, you have said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So immediately, in this story in Acts chapter 3, the man was strengthened. So my question was, well, hey, wait a minute. What about atrophy? You know, if you don't use your muscles and you just lay there for 35 or 40 years, you're not going to have any strength in your muscles. You'd have like noodles for arms. So my question was, Lord, what about atrophy? What, what, what was the deal with that? And so, atrophy, of course, is a gradual decline in the effectiveness uh, due to uh, underuse or neglect. If, if we don't exercise, if we don't use our limbs, they go south on us. So, here we have a man who has been lame from birth. So, Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power an outstretched arm, and there's nothing too difficult for you. And then 10 verses later in Jeremiah 32, 27, the Bible says, Behold, you are the God of heaven and earth. Is there anything too hard for you? It's a good question. Is there anything too hard for God? The Bible says in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me. I will answer thee. I will show thee great and mighty things which you know not. You know, and I have just learned to ask God for great and mighty things because it gives Him glory. It gives Him praise. You know, and I think we owe God praise and glory when He does something amazing in our life. Like save us from hell. <laughs> yeah. We need to praise the Lord for that. 
especially if you study that doctrine in Scripture. So we go on in the story. The man was leaping upwards, and then he began praising God. So he got healed, and then he began praising God. I think it's important to praise God before. I do. Before, when you're trodden down, before you get the victory to praise God is an amazing thing. And it really does change our heart. So the book of Psalms is a praise book of the Bible. It gives us hundreds of reasons why praise is important, as well as examples of how to give praise to God. In examining those reasons and examples, one thing becomes clear. It's good to praise the Lord and to make music to your name, O Most High. Psalm 92.1 says that. Praise is a good thing. I've been in a couple of churches, I'm not going to say where, where I didn't know who they were singing to. I never heard the name Jesus. I didn't hear the name God. They were just singing away, and I thought, man, if I was not a Christian, I'd come in and wonder, are they praising Buddha or Hare Krishna or who? Because you have to praise the living God. You have to praise the name of Jesus. So it's pleasant and it's valuable and it's morally excellent. Psalm 147.1 says that praise is beautiful and agreeable. When we consider the reasons why we should praise God, we find a whole list of God's attributes. Why should we praise Him? So let's take a look through the Bible. If you'll go back to Psalm, the book of Psalms, 138 Psalm. I have a friend. I can't say his name. But I, God uses him to get me to look up scriptures and send back to him. Um, all I could say is this man can find negative about anything. I don't care how positive it is, he will find a negative something about it. And it's, it's just always been that way. And I had a really good friend who said, would you take care of him when I go? My friend had, uh, had uh, cancer and then he had some problems with his heart and he knew he was going to die and he'd been kind of caretaking this guy. And he said, can you look after him? And I said, man, that's, that's a tall order, bro. And he said, well, if you love me, you'll look after him. <laughs> okay, I will. So I mean, I get, I get stuff like, okay, it rained the other day. Wasn't that awesome? We got rain. We've needed rain. He writes and says, well, the problem is, is there's going to be mudslides. And then after the mudslides, all the green's going to grow back up, and that's going to dry out, and then California's going to burn down again. And it was like, gee, what scripture shall I give him, Lord? And, and the Lord gave me this scripture, answer not a fool according to their folly, lest thou be like unto them. So I didn't have an answer for that one. But it's like, good night, are you always negative? So we got to look at, why should we praise the Lord? Why should we praise Him? Well, Psalm 138, verse 5, says, They will sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. And then Psalm 145, and verse 3, gives us another reason to praise the Lord. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised because His greatness is unsearchable. And then we look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 20. The book of Daniel after Ezekiel. Daniel 2 and verse 20 tells us that God is wise. Man, when we don't know how to do things, God can show us what to do. Daniel 2 and 20 says... Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever for his wisdom and the might that is his, the strength and the wisdom that God has. And then God is good. Psalm 107 and verse 8. Hey, if nothing else, we'll wear all the gold off the pages in our Bible doing this, you know. <laughs> Psalm 107 and verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Think about it. I don't think any of us walked here. We all drove here tonight on rubber tires, not, you know, Conestoga wagons with wooden wheels, on a paved road with comfortable seats that spring. 
And then we came into a building that have comfortable seats. And it's not cold in here. And so God has given us food to eat. We're going home to a roof over our head and a pillow to lay down on. Jesus didn't, didn't have a pillow to lay his head on. And look at how God has provided for us everything. God is good. He's merciful and faithful. Psalm 89.1 says, and so much more. So this list of attributes is complemented by a list of his wonderful works. He's the one who saves, saves us. So let's take a look at Psalm 18 and verse 46. And nobody else can. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter uh, 4, or Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only one name. And that's the name of Jesus. Psalm 18 and 46 says, The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. That's a song, by the way. He keeps his promises. 1 Kings 8, 56. 1 Kings chapter 8. And verse 56. The scripture says, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised, because there has not failed one word of all of his good promises which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. So let me tell you about one of the promises that God has fulfilled to me. The scripture says, When your father and mother forsake you, the Lord will take you up. There's another scripture that says anyone who has left houses and lands, uh, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, even wives and husbands, for the gospel and for the gospel's sake, shall receive in this life 100-fold mothers and brothers and sisters, etc. And you know what? Since my mom and dad passed away when I was young, I probably had 10 moms in the Lord who took care of me. And all kinds of fathers in the Lord who have fathered me. And brothers and sisters galore everywhere I go. Man, I think about all the places where I've either ministered or went to be ministered to. I've got brothers and sisters in Washington, in Oregon, in Idaho, in California, in Nevada. I've got them all over the place. Arkansas, Oklahoma, they're all over. Montana, in Wyoming, brothers and sisters everywhere. Even got a brother in Christ, who's my cousin, in Maine, all the way up by the Canadian border. Anywhere I go, I can find brothers and sisters in Christ. And I have all of you. And some of you thought you were going to get rid of me. And that ain't going to happen. Because I'm going to be with you for eternity. For eternity you're going to have to hear these stories. <laughs> okay. Remember this one? He gives us our daily bread. He does. It's amazing. I watch the little hummingbirds outside my window, and, and man, they are, they're like little fighters. They're like little jet fighters, you know, they fight each other. But man, they're getting fed, and you ought to see them, how they, they drink, you know, they, they lift up their little thing and drink it down, then put it, put it back in the, the syrup we make for them and do it again, and it's like God feeds them. God feeds the worms so the birds can eat the worms. <laughs> it is amazing how, how God feeds us. Psalm 148.10 tells us that all of creation is commanded to give praise to God. All of creation. So I want you to think about this. Spend some time in the forest sometime. Go out there and just go for a walk in the forest and leave your cell phone at home. You know all the trees are praising God. You can hear them clap their hands when the wind blows. You can see that they're all pointed straight up. You find these little flowers that at night they're closed, but in the morning when they wake up, their petals open to give praise to God. All creation, the birds when they sing, they give praise to God. Man, I got so convicted of that, Barbara, because when we were kids we had BB guns, and we used to shoot the birds in the back alley. And then I read that scripture that says, even when a sparrow falls, God knows about it. It's like, oh, Lord, forgive me. I, I might have a ministry in heaven of birds. 
you know, to all the birds that we took out, you know. Okay, come on, let's go this way. <laughs> God, God is an amazing God. He does so much for us. When Jesus was entering into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, great crowds gathered and offered him the praises. The Pharisees wanted him to rebuke the people, but Jesus said, I tell you that if these would hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. That's in Luke chapter 19. God says, if you shut these people up, the rocks will cry out. Though there are many people who choose not to praise God right now, there is coming a day when, in which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the praises of God. The Bible says let th in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not think a robbery to be equal with God, but he himself made himself of no reputation and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And because of that, God also highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of things in heaven and things on earth, even things under the earth, and that every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I talked to a Satanist one time, a Satanist, uh, I don't think he was a high priest, he was just a Satanist. And I said, you know, you're still going to confess Jesus is Lord. He said, no, I'm not. I said, yeah, you are. No, I'm not. I said, and go ahead and send a curse against me. I'll send it back a thousandfold. I have the power to do that. He just looked at me and I said, you will praise God. The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He walked away with his arms limp at his side, just walked away. The Bible says we can triumph over principalities and powers and the evil of this world by the name of Jesus. Amen? <laughs> I have to tell you this story. So, <laughs> I had one of our deacons, you remember Philip from the church? Had one of our deacons with us. We were in Pismo Beach street witnessing, and we had these four teenagers cornered. You know, you got to corner people if you want to talk to them about Jesus. So we had these, these four teenagers cornered, and we're talking to them about the Lord, and I had my Bible in my hand. Has anybody here ever been to Harry's Bar in Pismo? I went there one time. It is so loud, you can't even hear yourself think. You know, we were outside witnessing to these guys, and it was still loud. Some guy came stumbling out of the bar and came straight over to us, and I don't Obviously, demons brought him over. He, he, he was so drunk he could hardly walk, and he, he pointed his finger in my face. He said, you say one more word about Jesus, and I'm going to knock you all over this street. And he used a whole bunch of other adjectives, which we can't use right now. But most of us have used them in our life. <laughs> so. How something came over me, I just... I had my Bible in my hand, these four kids, their eyes got about that big. I turned around, I said, you know what, man? You touch me and God's going to break every bone in your body. He just looked at me and I said, he'll use me to do it. And the guy turned around and walked right back into Harry's bar. And those kids were like, whoa, we've never seen anything like that. Of course, Philip said, well, you're in the flesh. I said, I don't care if I'm in the flesh or in the spirit. He's back in the bar, ain't he? And then we just turned back around. And we, we witnessed, and two of those young men accepted Jesus as their Savior. And that's what I'm talking about. We have power. Jesus has given us authority in the name of Jesus Christ. He said that in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Behold, I give you power. That word power is the Greek word exousia, which means authority. I give you authority over serpents and over scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. How much is nothing? By any means will not hurt you. Jesus said, you have that authority. I've given you the badge of authority in the name of Jesus. And that's the way we pray. That's why we praise him because he's given us all this, all this authority. And I want to end with this. Praise is a vital part. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Brother Reuben and Pastor Joe and Kathy if you could come on up. 
Praise is a vital part of a life that's surrendered to God. And it gives credit. credit. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs, a man is perfected by his praise. You know, when you do a good job, isn't it great to hear, hey, good job, man. You know, not like my buddy that, well, it's not that good. You know, (laughs) we all like to be thanked and receive some sort of thank you when we do something out of the ordinary. What do you think God feels like? When God does these amazing things, don't you think he deserves praise? So I want to read uh, Psalm 107, verse 8, and we'll close. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. That's us. That's us. Oh, that God would get praise from us. Amen? So, Lord, we just want to thank you for this time that we can do just that. We want to sing praises to you. We want to, we want to thank you for saving these jobs that we prayed for here tonight, Lord. We know you're going to do it, and we give you thanks and praise beforehand. And, Lord, I just pray as we stand to our feet and give you praise and glory, that you would be glorified, Lord God, that you would move mightily on our behalf. We know you will. And we thank you for the angels that you put around us as well to minister to us. So we ask now that you fill this room with your presence and let our praises be acceptable to you, O God, in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to take some time and praise our God. I will bless the Lord.